Thanks everyone for being here. My name is Gordon Pedelford. I'm the Executive Director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. We're a nonprofit in Seattle, Washington. We work to make every neighborhood a great place to walk, bike, and live. We have four staff, but we are run by an amazing cohort of volunteers all across the city who are organizing in their own neighborhoods to make change. And I'm just so glad that you're all here tonight to listen to this 15 minute cities idea, which is really taking off like wildfire. And uh, we're happy to be partnering with the AIA Seattle as part of their series on 15 minute cities. Tonight, we're gonna hear from some pretty amazing panelists, which will be moderated by David Goldberg. Uh, David played a key role in developing national movements for smart growth and transportation reform. He led communications and strategy for Smart Growth of America, a national nonprofit based in DC and their transportation spinoff, Transportation for America. He currently works as the Washington State Department of Transportation uh, liaison on the 520 project and as the board of president or as the president board for Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And he serves on the Seattle Planning Commission. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thanks, Gordon. It's great to be here. Yeah, we have good representation from the Planning Commission tonight because two of our panelists are also on the Planning Commission. Uh, this is going to be a great discussion. We have some fantastic panelists tonight. Uh, for our discussion of recipes for walkability for a 15-minute city and a discussion of how we can bake them into Seattle's neighborhoods. Some quick housekeeping. We're hoping to increase the opportunities for interaction tonight by opening both the chat and the Q&A for everyone to access. If you have additional information or observations related to what you're hearing from a presenter, you can feel free to pop them into the chat. Put your questions in the Q&A box and the panelists will either type answers if they're quick questions in that Q&A box, or we'll put them in the queue and answer them in the, in the discussion portion to the degree we can get to them. Before we kick off the presentations, I want to offer a quick definition of what it is we're talking about. The term 15-minute city refers to complete walkable neighborhoods where people can fulfill six essential functions within a short walk or bike from home. Those functions are living, working, commerce, healthcare, education, and entertainment. While the basic ideas are as old as cities themselves, the term and the framing 15-minute city are attributed to Carlos Menos, a professor at the Sorbonne. The current mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, incorporated his ideas into her vision for the city and used them as the basis for her 2020 re-election. And the concept gained increasing currency and importance during the pandemic lockdown when we became painfully aware of what our neighbors did and did not provide for us. In July 2020, the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, an organization of about 100 major cities worldwide, published a framework for cities uh, to use the 15-minute city, 15 15-minute city concept to build back better while reducing climate impact. And some city leaders, like our mayor, Jenny Durkin, embraced it, though how strongly and for how long are a matter of debate. Tonight we'll be talking about how the concept applies in Seattle with a focus on how to achieve neighborhoods that are truly walkable. Each of our four panelists will present for about seven minutes and we'll follow with the discussion. I'll introduce each of them in a little more detail just before they speak. But here's a quick overview of how things will go uh, in terms of the presentations. Diana Quintanar will lead off with thoughts on the overarching principles and the considerations that should be brought to bear in thinking about 15 minute neighborhoods and walkability. Radhika Nair will follow with a look at where Seattle stands now in terms of our built environment and the planning and regulatory framework that shape it and the socio-political context that we're living in. Jeff Howell will bring our discussion to the neighborhood level, examining his own Seattle neighborhood through a 15 minute lens while contrasting the neighborhood in Taipei where he is living at the moment. Shannon Nickel will bring us down to the level of streets and blocks using her design expertise to explore how to make them truly great and livable for all. So Deanna's gonna kick us off. She's a mobility and urban design expert with experience in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors. Deanna relocated to Seattle in 2019 from Mexico City to join the engineering and planning firm WSP where she is the Seattle office lead. In Mexico City, she led the Authority of Public Space, as well as the Transportation Planning and Roads Office. During a stint as Mexico's first bicycle coordinator, 
she implemented the first automated public bike share in the Americas. She is, as I said, a member of the Planning Commission. Diana. Thank you so much. And I am just so thrilled and uh, excited to be here with you uh, tonight with this fantastic panel on this very, very uh, amazing concept to explore for, for all cities. Um, give me one second here while I share my screen. And I hope you all can see my screen now. Um, and so again, as uh, David was mentioning, uh, I'm hoping we can uh, discuss today some of the generalities around the concept of a 15 minute city and this idea, which uh, we know is not new, uh, but uh, has been around and is really uh, based around uh, the, the, the concept of a decentralization of services in urban areas where we can get to work, shop for food, go to school, go see a doctor, um, access uh, leisure and culture, all with in 15 minutes. And um, this, this concept really is, as David mentioned, uh, a concept around redesigning complete communities in which all city residents, and this is all, can meet most of their daily needs in this uh, 15 minute unit time. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that it centers where people live. Uh, and uh, where people live, of course, uh, will depend on who you are and, and what stage of life you're in. And so uh, the question around even why are we considering 15 minutes? And this is of course related to a typical human's willingness to walk. Uh, research really has shown that people are not willing to walk more than 20 minutes. So that's kind of the maximum time people are willing to uh, walk to meet one of their daily needs locally. Uh, but this 20 uh, minute journey represents a half mile walk uh, for an able bodied person uh, to reach their destination. Um, and of course, uh, who we center is, is, is at the core of this, of this exploration. And so if you're not an able-bodied person, this radius or the, the axis or reach uh, of things that you can, you can get to in this amount of time is reduced. So if you're talking about um, uh, walking, if you're a, 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 a child or a person with limited mobility or um, perhaps a senior, uh, you will be walking at a speed of about three feet per second. And so that means that um, you are also perhaps expected to be walking in flat terrain to be walking at this speed to reach to reach these these distances. Uh, in any case, um, as, as David mentioned, the concept that became popularized by uh, Anne Hidalgo, uh, the mayor of Paris, and um, that really was uh, developed by uh, Carlos Moreno, is, is a concept that we know is not new. It's a concept that, uh, in, in fact, is centers proximity and walkability as, as, as a tenant. And uh, a lot of cities right now are starting to use a similar concepts. So we have the one minute city of Sweden or the super blocks in Barcelona or Melbourne's 20 minute neighborhoods. Uh, but these all share the common decentralization and polycentric organization of cities. And so this concept became very relevant uh, since the pandemic because we have been forced to rethink how we restructure our lives by, by staying at home and working from home. And so it's a powerful concept in that way, uh, particularly, you know, I, I guess for those that are privileged uh, to have transitioned to work from home, and it's important to acknowledge it as a luxury, um, is that uh, you know we have seen it's possible to to really replace a long commute uh, and still be productive, and so this is really helping cities reevaluate how we structure our, our daily lives and 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 time. But this luxury of time uh, is something that uh, you know is 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 something that should be democratized and so we need to think about uh who you know who who is uh going to be able to uh be willing to have access to quality of life in a city through our policies uh and so the the, the best way really to increase quality of life is to give people uh time back 
And so this means different things for different groups and populations. And uh, as planners and decision makers and practitioners, we ought to understand these differences because not everybody has the same time, budget or travel needs uh, in our society. And so in, pre in pre pandemic times, uh, the Puget Sound had seen a, a steady increase um, in uh, what's termed a super commuter or people with extremely long commutes, that is uh, 90 minutes uh, one way uh, per, per commute. And so since 2010, the population of super commuters in the central Puget Sound region increased about 75%. And so now the region ranks third out of the top 25 metropolitan areas in the nation in this increase in super commuters. So it will be very interesting to see the data and patterns coming out of 20 2020, but in any case, this 15 minute city concept can really be so powerful and truly uh, impacting people's quality of life. And so it begs the question to apply an equity lens on where we can consider affordability and quality of opportunities people can access from their homes and uh, this time allocation for commuting uh, or travel budget as it's uh, termed uh, in, a, in a more um, wonky uh, environment uh, is different depending on income level and of course where, where people live. Um, so a 15 minute city conversation begins with assessing uh, a city or a neighborhood's walkability. And according to walk score, um, the city of Seattle apparently is very walkable. Uh, you know, uh, it, walk score uh, says Seattle is the eighth most walkable large city in the US. And uh, the ingredients, as we know, for walkable communities include high density, mix of uses, short blocks, higher, tighter density intersections, uh, roads with slow speeds, comfortable and pleasant routes. So at a first glance, uh, we would say that Seattle's ability to become a 15 minute city looks pretty promising. But walkability alone in this sense is uh, agnostic of, of quality of, of, of access to, to these amenities. And uh, in, in that sense, uh, we have to think, you know, who is Seattle, Seattle walkable for? Is it truly accessible and affordable for all? Are the parks and places someone can access equally acceptable in quality and throughout the city? And I think we all can probably agree that this is not the case if we spent some time in the city. So this begs the question of, you know, what are some of our major barriers to, to become a 15 minute city uh, and it, as it applies to, to Seattle and the Puget Sound region? And so we know and, and our panelists will help us explore several of these barriers and challenges to think about. Uh, one of the most prominent ones, of course, is uh, the fact of how we're zoned and the fact that single family housing is likely, uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge with 75% of zoning in the city being, being um, in, in this type of zoning or moreover, how we relocate more street space for pedestrians and cyclists to improve walking and cycling uh, in infrastructure with safer speeds. So. With this, um, I know that we have a great group of panelists to, to explore more of these ideas in detail, uh, but we really ought to try to have discussions like this more often and uh, create the regulatory environment that can encourage more of these inclusive zoning and mixed use developments in flexible buildings and spaces. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Diana. That's great. And a lot of a lot of food for thought and um, things to to uh, tease out of you to talk about more when we get to the discussion part. Uh, next up is Radhika Nair. She is an urban planner with a multidisciplinary background uh, in policy research and analysis, in land use planning, and community engagement. At Burke Consulting, Radhika manages projects including community and economic development plans, housing studies, and park system plans. She most enjoys her work when she's integrating equity and social justice into decision and policy making in order to affect change that benefits BIPOC, BIPOC, impoverished, and immigrant communities. As I said, she also is a member of the Seattle Planning Commission. Radhika? Thanks, David. Um, and thanks, Diana, for setting up the regulatory framework, which is why I'd, uh, I'd like to spend some time on. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, and hopefully it will come up for you all. Um, I'm using my husband's Mac, so it's a little 
different today. Um, can you all see my screen? Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Um, so something I wanted to talk about, which steps back a bit from zoning is Seattle's growth strategy and its comprehensive plan, or its currently adopted comprehensive plan. It is going through a major update, uh, which will happen in 2024. And the foundation of Seattle's comprehensive plan is its urban village strategy or its growth strategy. Um, and the growth strategy, the urban village strategy is the city's unique uh, response to the state mandated growth management acts a requirement for cities to plan. So the way the strategy is intended to work is that it concentrates growth in specific areas of the city, um, as you can see in the different colors that I'll just talk about in a second. Um, and it, it's intended to create these concentrated areas of growth that's pedestrian friendly, is compact and has a mix of uses. Um, currently Seattle has about six urban centers. They are these darker blue ones there that includes downtown and includes some uh, denser areas like Uptown, South Lake Union, Capitol Hill, University District, and Northgate. But there are also 24 urban villages um, and they come in two flavors. That's too much detail that I won't get into right now. But these 24 urban villages um, are noted here in the light blue, um, all these ones. Um, and then there are two manufacturing industrial centers that are in gray, um, and those are intended to be where industrial activity and industrial employment will be concentrated. And the urban village strategy has been really successful in concentrating growth. Um, it has been in place for 20 some years or so. And in those years, uh, most, uh, I would say 75% of new housing and new jobs have uh, been in the urban villages uh, and the urban centers, uh, even though they only occupy 17% of the city. So it has been a really successful strategy for Seattle. But one thing to understand is how these urban village boundaries and how these um, villages were defined. Um, and the strategy was adopted in 1994, uh, shortly following the Growth Management Act. Um, and the city gave a lot of leeway to neighborhood groups to come up with these uh, boundaries and to define urban villages. And as a result, as you can see, they come in very many different shapes and sizes and, and scales. Uh, this one here, for instance, this is very different from another. And um, the other thing to note is that the city proposed boundaries, um, but neighborhoods carved out many areas out of those boundaries. So this um, chart here shows the Wallingford urban village um, and the, the dashed line is the, is the area that was included in the neighborhood planning. And the, uh, the dashed line in here in gray is the urban village boundary. So what happened was that um, there was a lot of discussion about urban village boundaries by people who lived outside of the urban villages and people who were inside the urban villages didn't necessarily have more say or it was never evaluated how much they participated in the process. Um, and one, one other thing to note is that this was in 1994. This was before the city had the race and social justice initiative or the racial equity lens. Um, and the, this was not a broad and inclusive process that uh, included people of color or people whose voices are typically not heard in a planning process. Something else that is worth noting is how many urban villages there aren't. For instance, uh, Magnolia over here, uh, which has a really walkable center, um, has good schools, good parks, does not have an urban village. Uh, uh, similarly, Laurelhurst doesn't have an urban village. Montlake here, um, really good schools, parks, quick access to the east side, um, no urban village. Uh, there are walkable areas in Ravenna, Bryant, um, Wedgwood, where I live, uh, which has good parks, good schools, um, uh, but that's not included in an urban village. Um, and so you can see that the urban village strategy has created what 
many planners talk about as a downside of uh, 15 minute cities, which is that you're not intended to create islands of walkability. Uh, the idea is that they would be overlapping um, areas that are connected in this polycentric fashion. And in many ways, that's um, not what the growth strategy that we currently have um, would get us to. And the comprehensive plan, the 2024 update is a real great opportunity to rethink the growth strategy. But before we talk about citywide changes, I will turn it over to Jeff to talk a bit more about the neighborhood scale. I want to introduce Jeff Howe. Jeff is professor of landscape architecture and director of Urban, Urban Commons Lab. Let me turn my, my uh, camera back on here. Sorry about that. Uh, in addition to being a landscape architect, he is someone who's well known for his pioneering writings on guerrilla urbanism and bottom up placemaking, something I want to hear a lot more about. His work focuses on civic engagement, community design, public space, democracy, and design activism. During the pandemic, Jeff was, has been focused on mutual aid efforts among the marginalized social groups and, and has been involved in projects, including the Seattle Street Sync. Jeff? Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And, uh, and thanks to uh, the Seattle Neighborhood Greenway for uh, this wonderful invitation. Uh, it's not often that the planning concept uh, captured the imagination of a large group of people around the world and uh, 15 minutes really happened to be uh, one of them. What uh, I want to kind of, it's great to kind of follow uh, Diana and uh, Rika and uh, to build on what uh, they have uh, laid out as uh, sort of a concept and, and uh, bring it down to uh, the, the ground uh, level uh, in my talk. I. Uh, I'm actually speaking to you from Taipei today, uh, like David has said, uh, but I was also in Seattle in the beginning of the pandemic early uh, last year. And, uh, and like everybody else, uh, you know, one of the things that we have done most often during the pandemic was to walk around our neighborhood, which was what I did. Uh, and, I, and I got to know my neighborhood uh, really well uh, through all the walks. And I was, as I was walking around my neighborhood, I realized that uh, you know, my neighborhood was already a 15 minute uh, neighborhood, uh, which argue, one can argue is a building block for a 15 minute city. And uh, so I thought I would start uh, from there uh, in my talk uh, today. So this is my block in, uh, the, in the Bryant neighborhood uh, located between Wedgwood and Ravenna. Uh, you may recognize a few things uh, here in the Google Earth view. And uh, in my neighborhood, I was quite fortunate to have uh, two grocery market uh, within 10 minutes of walking. Uh, or more if we go a little uh, farther. Uh, there are also three parts of different scale, uh, ranging from a neighborhood scale to urban scale within 10 to 15 minutes of walking, biking. Uh, or riding a bus. We are also within 10 minutes of walking to uh, our nearest elementary school and middle school, which uh, our kids uh, went to, and also within 10 minutes to Roseville High uh, by bus. My spouse and I can both get to work within 10 to 15 minutes uh, by bus uh, to UW and also to uh, the Green Lake Community Center. Uh, we can also get to uh, the Seattle Children's Hospital and the Utah Medical Center uh, within 10 to 15 minutes by bus as well. Uh, so this is all great. And we have uh, really enjoyed our time uh, living in Seattle over the past 20 years and look forward to be coming back. Uh, but we do, and we do recognize that not uh, every neighborhood uh, is like this. Uh, but I also know that our neighborhood is not the only one with this kind of uh, convenience and walkability. Uh, but something that's not quite right uh, with our neighborhood in Bryant, uh, which is why I think we're still uh, far away from becoming a 15 minute city uh, or a 15 minute neighborhood. Now, first, there are just not enough people uh, with access to this 15 minute convenience. Uh, 
the density is simply uh, too low. Uh, and then there are also issues of demographics and, uh, and as well as diversity of housing types. Uh, while many neighborhoods in Seattle have great walkability, as uh, mentioned by the previous speakers, that kind of walkability is not available to everybody. Uh, so how can we address this issue? Uh, obviously, increasing density is a, uh, a necessary strategy. If you look at the four criteria for the 15-minute city as laid out by Klaus Moreno, uh, we're missing out on most of the criteria given our predominantly single-family uh, residential zoning. And this is one of the most fundamental barriers, in my view, uh, to 15-minute city concept in Seattle. Uh, so what does a, a city of higher density uh, look like? Uh, how is it better in serving a greater number of people? I, I thought it might be interesting to compare uh, Brian with my uh, current neighborhood here in Taipei, uh, which is uh, Dahan, uh, shown at the same scale uh, here. So you can see the blocks in Taipei on the, uh, on the right hand side are much more compact, uh, or much more finer grain. Uh, it's also much easier to get to places by foot, uh, bike, and also with public transit. With a greater number of people, the city can support a greater number, a, a, a also a variety of services and businesses. Uh, take the uh, grocery market as an example. Uh, so within about the same walking distance uh, or time, uh, I have access in Taipei to in my neighborhood to eight different grocery markets. Uh, you know, more choices and greater uh, price range from the uh, the very traditional. Uh, uh, produce market to uh, a market that uh, focus on imported uh, goods uh, from overseas. Uh, and not to mention, you know, schools, parks, uh, greenways, and hospitals all accessible within 10, uh, 15 minutes of walking. And then with the metro system, pretty much the entire downtown can be reached in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, but most importantly, this urban fabric can serve a greater number of people. Uh, obviously, it's not uh, you know, conceivable or even desirable for our neighborhood in Seattle to become, uh, become like those in Taipei with the density that is more than 10 times uh, that of uh, uh, you know, comparing uh, Brian with Dime, for example. It's also a very different kind of lifestyles and uh, social fabric. But what if we can uh, strategically uh, increase the density in, uh, in some locations in Seattle, just a little bit more, uh, and you know, in neighborhoods where many of uh, the amenities and services are missing, what if we can increase the density and the number of residents so that the uh, businesses and services can become viable uh, in those uh, neighborhoods? And uh, so how can we bring walkability to a greater segment of our population? Uh, how can we achieve not only proximity, but also diversity, density, and ubiquity? Uh, these, uh, these ingredients also need to be part of the recipe for walkability. Uh, thank you. Excellent, Jeffrey. I really interesting way to bring it home to Seattle and also introduce uh, some ideas from outside of Seattle. Um, I want to introduce Shannon Nickel. Shannon is a landscape architect and co-founder of Gustafson Guthrie Nickel, or GGN. Her designs, including Chicago's Lurie Garden and Boston's North End Parks, are recognized for being deeply embedded in their social contexts. Since 2016, Shannon has been the leading design uh, has been leading the design for India Basin Shoreline Park in San Francisco's Bayview neighborhood, seeking to restore walking connections to local services and amenities in the historically isolated and underserved neighborhood. Shannon? Thank you, David. And uh, I, I seem to have an unfortunate pattern of following Jeff um, in uh, presenting uh, and uh, people that I admire. Um, I am not a planner. Um, I am not a policymaker. I am a designer. And the scope that I usually have as a landscape architect, quite frankly, is selecting street trees, designing plantings and furnishings and things like that, that contribute, we like to think, 
um, contribute to the sense of potential and alignment with a walkable place, a place that prioritizes local life and daily life and the people who might be living in a space and using it every day. Um, and we've been doing our best to do that over the last over 20 years uh, in, in our projects. So bit by bit, we get these little scopes, it might be a sidewalk on one side of a block, it might be one crossing, it might be you know designing the details of something. But we've really been focused on how much can we with these, these iterative little scopes um, emphasize and build help people see, build up that um, mentality of looking at our streets as part of the neighborhood ground. And right now, as I think we all are aware, when we look at a 15 minute radius of walking around most of us, we probably don't have enough available ground to serve um, our needs and the mobility um, options that we'd like to have on foot. So uh, just, talking about some of the things we do with our scopes that may be sidewalks around the perimeter of a building or something like that. We like to step back and get ourselves, the architects we're working with, and also the folks that may be coming to community meetings into a mindset of um, seeing the streets as their local neighborhood ground, not just as uh, vector lines that are engineered devices that are sort of dividing the neighborhood up. So here's South Lake Union in Seattle. This is one of the drawings my colleague David Malda um, did. And I love this because it helps us just remind us that streets are simply excerpts of a larger piece of ground that we all share. And each part of the ground is different. It has a topography. It's way older than us. It's way older than the current paint lines on the street. But when we start to see streets as ground, we start to see them as surfaces for living and shared space. They're omnidirectional surfaces. They're not just linear um, tubes that are aligned that we're, we're fighting over. Um, and I think that's important because when we all travel to other parts of the world, this happens to be the Dotenbori in Osaka, um, we see that there's places where streets are simply treated as spaces between buildings. And that simple notion is actually, of course, really old, but it's also beautiful and pleasurable and it feels safe and you can let go of your kid's hand. And I find it thrilling to get into these kinds of spaces as somebody who's lived in Seattle for 30 years and grew up in the Western US. Uh, so it's interesting to look, um, we always like looking at how much streets have changed in just the last few decades, especially in America, uh, to remind us that we can change them again and make them more um, accommodating of all the things we need to fit in a 15 minute neighborhood. So here's Pine Street looking from First Avenue East uh, up to Capitol Hill in 1936. And one of the things we notice is the pace and scale of all the little details and signs that are reaching out to the pedestrian pace of walking. It's on a second scale, not even a minute scale. Then we go to 1963, everything's one way, everything's about regional flow. How much can we charge this whole corridor as this vector line between distant places we don't even see? And the local folks are not being served. There's not kids in the street. There's not people standing and talking in the street. And I want to bring kids up because as a landscape architect, they're one of my main constituents. They are so poorly served in the city. Um, and I would say that um, play, you know, definitely overlaps with four of the six um, uses that were talked about as the, as the livable, livable city uses, living, healthcare, education, and entertainment. Um, play is all of those things. And how do we get back to the point of this is normal. This is what streets have been used for for millennia. And kids are on a one minute neighborhood, not a 15 minute neighborhood. Parents would love in the apartment buildings in our denser neighborhoods to be able to open their front door and let go of their kid's hand and let their kid play there. That's a one minute thing. So we have a long ways to go, but I'm super excited about the 15 minute um, neighborhood concept. So how do we as designers, uh, architects, landscape architects, but also just people thinking about what our expectations should be in our streets in front of our front doors. 
How do we rebuild the local ground for humans to walk on, live in, and play in? Space for us to exist and survive outside of our front doors. And one of the things we do as designers is we pretend, we pretend even if it doesn't look like it right now, that every square foot of the spaces in between our buildings is valuable, valuable at the human scale. So this happens to be the tunnel ride. Probably a lot of you did it a few years ago when the tunnel opened in Seattle. This is my kid giving me adrenaline just standing on this piece of infrastructure that's designed for 60 mile per hour vehicles. We, everybody was stopping and resting. There was no cars there. How do we get from this feeling of like, we shouldn't be here in this space on this detached piece of infrastructure to this is part of my local ground and it's safe. It's, it's earth I can stand on and use and walk on in multiple directions. And so a lot of times in my industry, the first um, impulse may be expensive unit pavers. They do work. There is something about the unit paver. It's the hand, scale of the hand. It's the scale of the human. It also shows this attention to the value of the ground surface and it breaks down the scale. It creates friction. It slows fast things down. There's all sorts of great things that unit pavers do, but sometimes we die on that sword. If you can't afford to put unit pavers across the street, then it's like the baby goes with the bathwater talking about kids. So I just wanted to bring up some local examples of small steps that my firm has been involved in to um, just like little design details that can help things feel more like spaces for people with really cheap materials. This is at the Burke Museum at the University of Washington. It's a parking lot with some concrete around it. But if you notice, there's not the typical vehicle uh, speed uh, radius paint corners, rounded corners in the paint. There's sharp 90 degree corners. We're saying this is at the scale of the human hand and eye for somebody standing there. This is designed like a room. And as a result, it has been, it's not a perfect space, but it's calmed the way that people drive. And one of the things that's delighted me is during the pandemic, and actually even now that it's being used, people are teaching their kids to skateboard there, ride their bikes there, all the things like, what do you do with pavement that feels kind of safe, like you're not gonna get run over? Um, the other thing we did here, and it took a lot of work, was get rid of curbs. You can see we have bollards and texture strips. Um, it's accessible, number one, for people on wheels or who maybe have various kinds of physical um, challenges. But it also puts the people in the vehicles and the people um, on foot in this same space. So when you're driving there, you feel a little like someone might walk out in front of you at any time. So you slow down. Again, it's a first step. Right next to it, part of this was working on 43rd Street and it is Stevens Way. Here, it is a pedestrian mall. There was a lot of questions during our process. Should we then make it a wavy path so it looks like a human path and not a street? And there was a really interesting dialogue about, well, it's not really a street because there's not cars on it. You shouldn't call it a street. And we said, no, we are excited to call this a street. It is a complete intersection with four streets that meet here one of them happens to only have only only have human beings on it, um, but it is equal to the other streets. So we purposely designed this um, meeting of paths to be equal on all four sides, flexible, no curbs. Um, and it is, in our view, a 100% crossing of paths in the city. This is all about how do we elevate the importance and visibility of walking in our ground that we have in the city, which is streets, 30% of our ground. Um, then uh, just a few examples before I close. Second Avenue um, uh, at Seattle Center is a prototype you can find locally with, uh, it does have unit pavers, but they're affordable locally produced concrete pavers, no curbs, the water drains and actually infiltrates along the edges. Seattle Center was great on this. This is was really looked at as being what is an affordable replicable design for a curbless street that does allow heavy truck truck traffic on it at times but also could be uh, not only a place for people to walk linear uh, up and down the corridor corridor but have events and all sorts of different uses on it this happens to be pride weekend which is one of my favorite times 
to go. And this is Pride Month, so I thought it would be a fun um, example to share. And then I'm just going to close out on um, thinking about that cross grain. As designers, we can think about the cross grain to balance out that fast linear um, emphasis. And one of the interesting examples of this recently, uh, last year, were the Black Lives Matter uh, murals that started here in Seattle. But there was something about the letters and these gestures that occupied the middle of the street and also created this crosswise cadence of the letters that slowed, it to told you that this was a place that people were using and occupying. Um, and uh, it's not business as usual. And that the materials are inexpensive for that. And I'm gonna close on North End Parks uh, in Boston. It was part of a linear um, freeway uh, lid there was a lot of pressure to um, make this entire 1.7 mile park sort of uniform and parallel to the dominant direction of traffic. We really uh, were interested in emphasizing the local cross traffic. And this is Little Salem Street. This is actually a right away that we pulled across the parks. We thought it was important to have streets, local streets, um, connecting through these little parks for, this, for the additional options they bring for walking routes that people could take locally in their neighborhoods. And I'll uh, end on that note. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so I realized that, that this is a lot to take in in that when you're starting to think about how we would put together 15 minute cities, you're, you're starting at a regional scale and you're getting down to a, a, the city level. And then what do we do in, the, in terms of how do we make the, arrange the neighborhoods and then right down to how do we make the most use out of the right of way that our streets represent to make them not only safe to get around if you're on foot or, or rolling, but also places to play. And I love Shannon's, uh, uh, um, uh, elucidation of play and how many how many things that it touches on. In fact, maybe that should even be its own thing. Although you're right, that play plays into so many of those other uh, of those other six as of the other six aspects. Um, you know, we and we we talked about so many things and we didn't even really talk about the the, the regional scale. How do all these how do these uh, individual neighborhoods that, that are, are walkable add up to a region where we have far flung employment and we have people, as Deanna pointed out. You know, making 90 minute commutes. Um, so I, with all that swimming around in our heads, I, I kind of want to ask, where should we start? Um, you know, Radhika pointed out some places on the map that are already looking like maybe the beginnings of a 15 minute city. Jeff pointed out that we have some parts of the city where you can actually get access to a lot of things, but we, but maybe there aren't enough people who can get that access because we don't have the density. And then we other other parts of the city where we have not enough density to support all the services that would be required for a walkable neighborhood. And when and, and the, with the lens we're using here today uh, um, uh, with, with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways being our sponsor is really that walkable neighborhood we wanna to get to, but where do we, where would we start? And any, any of you can jump in that feels like you wanna to, want to do it, but where would you start in just picking this apart and taking those first baby steps towards a, a real aspiration to, toward a 15 minute city? Since you presented last, Shannon, I'll put you on the spot first. Uh, certainly, I was thinking since I presented last, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you would get a break. They've had enough of me. Um, I uh, where would I start? Well, there's there's low hanging fruit, and then someone also had a question in the chat is like, think bigger, tell us you know bigger things that need to be done. But I'm a low hanging fruit professional. So I'll start with that and someone else can come in with some more profound um, changes. Uh, this is, I'm just going to pick a place, but traffic warrants um, have, I've, I've spent a lot of my time in Seattle and a few other cities on, um, and this is getting better, but where are controlled crossings? So as looking at things, not as an ornamental space, but simply as uh, uh, looking at space in our city, 
as how people survive and get from point A to point B when they're on foot, which may not be parallel to the hierarchy of vehicle corridors. And um, let's take Mercer Street, for instance. There's a really high density of seniors that live on opposite sides of Mercer Street from where their services and bus stops are. But there are many missing controlled intersections there because they don't have traffic warrants per MUTCD and other um, standards, meaning there's not enough cross traffic. There might not be enough numbers of pedestrians or documented accidents to warrant a signalized crossing. In my view, um, that mean, that's all the more reason why we need a signalized crossing there because there's poor folks that are there by themselves that don't have a crowd of people around them making them more visible or a vehicle, which is the only thing us as drivers notice at intersections, they need the support of a controlled intersection and you need it every block, especially if you're physically impaired, you're a kid um, or you're elderly. So, uh, there's a lot of missing controlled intersections in our city. And we spend a lot of money to put hawk lights and all sorts of dance dances around putting a flipping stop sign in, which is cheap. Um, put a four-way stop or put a um, traffic light in. But it's, at the, it's, it's concerns about um, slowing down the flow or time from point A to point B on some of these um, prioritized uh, traffic ways. And I, I respect the person in the chat who said, it's not just about those big, ugly roads, we need to do more comprehensive things about density. And I, I do agree with that. Jeff, I'm curious, you, um, uh, you raised the issue of, of making a neighborhood like yours denser. Um, is that where you'd start? And how would you do it? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, at, uh, at a basic level, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, but I think we need to be strategic. It's not just throwing density uh, everywhere. Uh, I mean, we have a, a model to build on. I think the urban village concept that Rohita uh, uh, mentioned, I think is, uh, we should be able to build on that, but perhaps looking at something that's kind of in between you know, uh, the, the, rea the reality that we have now uh, and the, uh, what has been uh, accomplished with the urban village. And, you know, maybe I think there's something between that we could, you know, consider and expand uh, the practice to uh, places in the city, but this, you know, especially in the, in the Northeast that has been, uh, you know, resisting uh, uh, the urban village concept for, uh, you know, such a long time. And, uh, and you know, so, for example, uh, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, I, actually, I actually live in a town hall, which is already a higher density uh, than the single family uh, you know, dwellings. But the town homes in I think most neighborhoods in, in Seattle are very piecemeal. They don't really create a, a, uh, a desirable uh, environment except for the individual units on their own. Uh, the, 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 the physical fabric of the city is, pretty, is still pretty much designed for uh, the single family dwellings. And uh, so I think there is a urban, uh, urban design uh, uh, kind of exercise that is needed you know, to create uh, you know, you know, a denser neighborhood that people would love to live, uh, not because they, they can only afford to, uh, but these are you know, desirable places that uh, you would enjoy you know, closer proximity with your neighbors, you can walk to places, your kids can play with other kids in the neighborhood, uh, rather than having you, you know, drive them around, uh, uh, you know, like across towns. You know, that is not a sustainable uh, way of living. Uh, so I think we should be looking more proactively, uh, not at the, not in terms of just housing type, but also in terms of creating the kind of neighborhood that people would not want to live with a higher density. So that's the place that I would start. I can I can see us drawing block sheds around major neighborhood assets, like um, a walkable neighborhood center or a transit stop, um, something like that, and trying to understand what's missing uh, to make it a more complete neighborhood, and using that to frame up uh, what kinds of investments the city could make or what might be those partnerships because 
it feels like each neighborhood would have something that's a bit unique that's missing. And so you wouldn't have the same starting point in, in every neighborhood. I can see that analysis and a conversation being the starting point. I'd like to uh, maybe uh, piggyback on, on Radhika's uh, idea, because I absolutely think that that is the way to start. And I think the first thing is to provide an, uh, uh, an assessment of you know where where are the areas or the neighborhoods that we would uh, deem as most complete um, and start with those that are actually are the most incomplete and uh, have the largest amount of people living in them so uh, crossing uh, high density with perhaps uh, areas with uh, low access to opportunity. And that's something that the city of Seattle has already done. They've mapped, um, uh, the, uh, uh, they've, they've done a, an index around uh, access to opportunity uh, for, for the city. And so looking at those neighborhoods and then uh, making sure that uh, we, we are always cautious uh, as practitioners who we always think uh, we know best and uh, we tend to love to make choices uh, for people, especially for the poor or disenfranchised populations. So making sure that we can go directly to these communities once we identified some of these gaps and ask them. And I, in fact, remember meeting for the first time Jeff uh, about three years ago, and he presented a series of fantastic ways in which to do outreach around these creative ideas and he presented um, a, an idea around the, uh, I'm probably butchering the name of it, Jeff, so please jump in, um, uh, to create basically your neighborhood uh, buffet. And so if we were to say you have a tray and that is your 15 minute city neighborhood, and you were to try to put the kinds of destinations or amenities that you like to reach, uh, what would the tray of a senior citizen or a senior resident uh, look like uh, if they were living in close proximity to say a child's uh, uh, 15 minute city neighborhood? What would that tray uh, have? Uh, it probably would have a school and a playground and, um, and parks and, and places like that. What, uh, and there might be an overlap with that of the senior uh, resident uh, who would also want to enjoy that park, but they would both have different needs. And so uh, looking also at how to look at our cities and repurpose through time of day or mul have multi-use and function is also a very immediate way to try to start addressing some of the deficits. Uh, so that's uh, how I believe we should engage is first and foremost, analyze and identify uh, where com communities need to be completed, then go to the, the communities themselves and ask them what they need and what they would like to see there. And then of course, uh, turn to policy and identify ways in which we can support those communities to, to get there quicker. So um, I think I wanna put, put this to the side for a minute, but, but, but that brings to mind the, uh, the politics of all this. And you know the 15-minute city framing seems to have captured a lot of people's imagination. I'm not so sure that folks who are facing displacement and gentrification would be as excited. I mean, they might might see this as something that is going to bring uh, money to their neighborhoods and and might mean that there's not a place for them once it all happens. So um, there's there's that aspect of the politics, and there's of course the folks who are living in those single-family areas uh, who are a little wealthier and. Um, are fine uh, existing mostly in the car, it seems. And, um, may, but maybe not, maybe, maybe there are some allies in there that we don't know about. So it, it seems like uh, you're, if you're gonna ask me where, where to start, one is having some really serious conversations about folks who have been the most vulnerable and, the, and, the, and benefited the least from our growth over the years. And really ask them, does 15 minute city, uh, does that resonate with you? And if it does, What's in your 15 minute city? You know, I, I, I live in Wallingford. I have sort of a 15 minute opportunity here and, I, and it's great. And I kind of know what I like about it. And I know what I think is missing. Um, and if somebody came and asked me, I'd have some ideas, but I would, I would really love, you know, personally love to, to start that conversation uh, at that level and then find, you know, neighborhoods that want to put their hands up and say, hey, why don't you start here? And we'll do, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be your guinea pigs. and. And we'll we'll build on the assets that we have, and we'll fill in the gaps that exist, and that kind of thing. Um, 
But I want to shift for a second to transit. A couple of people have raised that in the questions. Uh, is, does transit have a, have a role in all this? Is, is 15 minutes, is, is transit part of the 15 minute calculus? And I'm also interested in, in the idea that we are building a lot of transit, a lot of high capacity transit in, in Seattle. If we get ST3 built and we get the, the West Seattle, the Ballard built, we will have, what is it, 40-ish stations in, in the city which you know, really, if we were gonna do it right, almost all of them, except maybe in the industrial areas would be, which is another question, why do we have them in the industrial areas? But um, almost all of them, it seems to me, would be 15 minute neighborhoods. So I don't know, start with this question, does transit have a, have a role in this 15 minutes conversation and what role is that? And you, why don't you all just take yourselves off mute and feel free to, to have a more uh, free form conversation. Uh, sure, I, I can jump in. I think uh, I think transit is definitely uh, part of the 15 minute city. I think most of the the rhetoric is around walking and biking. But if you uh, if you're a transit user, you know that uh, you know trend, you know, public transit is sort of an extension of walking. You're more likely to walk if you can pub, you know take public transit to you know from point A to point B. And uh, so I would like to see you know, public transit as have, you know, play a much more prominent role in, in, in the discourse on fit in the city and we need, really need to look at it. I'll jump in right there. And I think that there's two ways of looking at transit in, in this in the through this framework of the 15 minute city. And one is to see the transit station as an amenity or a destination in it of itself. And so uh, as long as you have a transit station that you can live uh, uh, close by to or that you can connect easily to by a secondary means of, of transportation, um, you know, that's that's essential, uh, I believe, to make sure that we are connecting different neighborhoods and di different 15 minute neighborhoods together. So that's that's one piece. The second is, of course, the opportunity that David uh, 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 called out, which is we're investing uh, massive amounts of of uh, money and, and transit projects and expansions. And so every single node, uh, of course, we know like a cousin of this concept is transit oriented development of transit oriented communities. And so they're one and the same. So I think we're talking about parallel concepts and, and, and opportunities, one which centers the transit station at, at the center of that 15 minute walk shed and the other in which we can make the transit station a destination or an obliged destination of any community uh, to, to reach there. I just, uh, I guess, pile on a little bit that I see that as a yes and um, answer. And I hope that we can have great livable places that um, you don't need to be a uh, uh, you know, adult in your prime of life to, to navigate. Um, hopefully transit will become uh, that accessible for us soon. But there is, um, and I'm not saying that's what's going on here, but I'm always interested in Seattle that we have, I've been here for a long time, I do it too, but there's that sense of almost like pitting great ideas against each other. And what I love about the 15 minute city is it's this like underlayment in a way it's sort of talking about, and maybe it's because I'm a landscape architect, so I see it through a certain lens, but I'm like, let's treat the ground, um, let's fix the ground and, and have transit and have mobility and have the ability to commute. But let's, and I think one of the things that we're all saying is let's make sure the ground is awesome and accessible and equitable on both ends of the line. So mm -hmm. if the, the end of the line for the commuter that, needs to live outside of the increasingly expensive city center should have an awesome walkable livable safe ground to let go of their kids hand uh, and and it should also be that way which it's not right now in central seattle transit will likely play a really important role in the transition too jobs are pretty centralized in seattle and if we want um, to make sure that there's access to jobs I think transit would need to play a part uh, in the 15 minute city. Which brings uh, us back. Oh, sorry, Dave. Go ahead. 
No, just uh, I think it brings us back to also uh, I think the uh, real spur of the concept, right? And as I brought up in 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 my uh, initial remarks, uh, the pandemic really is what has made this this idea and this framework really come to life and and really have uh, cities and and leaders think about how to have successful recovery, particularly now that we've had such a fundamental shift in the way we work and the way um, uh, people are, are allocating their their productive time during a day. And so uh, the question really is, uh, what is going to be the future? And we know that this is a question that um, is being explored in many other uh, forums, but the future of our downtown, knowing that the majority of uh, that space is office space, and now uh, people are not necessarily going to be going downtown, uh, at least not not every day. Uh, it is a fact that people that at least are uh, office dependent or uh, uh, that they used to go to the office, like I said, who, we have the privilege to work in an office and not necessarily be um, uh, someone that, you know, couldn't work from home during the pandemic, uh, which is, is part of the fundamental question. How can we make this 15 minute city concept apply to both uh, those that can telecommute and those that cannot? And I think uh, the, 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 the beauty of the, of the concept and the lens and the framework is uh, ensuring that we can uh, re return that quality of life and access to achieve many of your needs um, uh, within uh, that 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 unit of time that is is reasonable and possible. Um, one of our attendees, Mike Eliasson, writes that density is the overwhelming problem keeping from making most of Seattle walkable, let alone anywhere close to a 15 minute city. Nibbling around the edges with small scale changes isn't going to move that needle. Focusing everything on loud polluted arterials won't either. Where's the guiding vision from Seattle's leading firms and politicians on what a sustainable, dense, livable Seattle could look like is the comp plan the problem? And there's a whole bunch packed in there. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's the, the idea of focusing everything on loud polluted arterials is one of the um, artifacts of the urban village strategy as it's been pursued. As Radhika was was pointing out, when we when we drew these boundaries to sort of keep the single family areas off limits, um, we we tended to put all the multifamily around around arterials. And that is an issue. Robert Randall's in the in the uh, Q and A uh, raises the issue of the of Aurora Avenue. You know, Aurora has has a lot of, of stuff has been migrating towards Aurora um, under the current zoning and the and the planning regime, um, but it's still a very dangerous state highway. So there's there's a lot um, there's a lot to fix about we, what we've done to this point, and uh, a lot to to figure out about how we make our growth strategy work better. His last question is the comp plan the problem. I want to reframe that. Is the comp plan the solution? We're starting to work on getting to a new comprehensive plan uh, to start to rethink or evolve, I guess, the growth strategy a little bit. Is there an opportunity here, and where what where should we put our focus? Um, in revising the growth strategy and, and, and putting down some firm policies uh, in the next comp plan, which, which is intended to guide how the city grows. Well, I think to continue uh, what I mentioned before, I think you know, uh, building on the urban village strategy, uh, maybe there uh, needs to be so a, a second level Maybe we can call it an urban sub-village uh, strategy, uh, you know, taking, uh, uh, looking at what worked and what did not work. Uh, and perhaps in addition to looking at uh, these major transit centers, you know, looking at you know, neighborhoods uh, and, and how can we introduce density at the next uh, level. And I agree with, uh, I think what others had mentioned before that you know, every neighborhood is unique in some way that we need a different kind of strategy and that uh, that and those strategy, I think, need to be developed through you know, consultation through bottom up uh, process. And uh, so I think we're looking at a, a uh, we need to be looking at a creative uh, kind of neighborhood planning process to kind of move, move forward. And, uh, and I think we do need to kind of uh, uh, incorporate that into the comp plan uh, process. 
I agree with the bottom up approach and a creative neighborhood planning process that we can come up with a growth strategy that includes more people and reflects um, what's possible in Seattle. It seems like along with that bottom up planning, we should, uh, we should communicate some frameworks for what say a rational framework for um, how we might think about the size of these and the overlap of these and how these might connect because um, learning some lessons from the past um, in terms of how the boundaries have played out and how those conversations have gone would be really important. Um, I also think that there's, there's um, concern from many communities when cities come in and make lots of investments that really increase the quality of life. Um, it can lead to gentrification, so balancing balancing that and approaching this with a racial equity lens um, is really important. Those are like evolving the growth strategy and not just tinkering with the urban village strategy, I think is really important and approaching it with um, an equity lens. Yeah, I think it's really important for the comprehensive plan. Rock Howell, one of our attendees writes, we have so many small neighborhood business nodes that lack an urban village designation. Could we start by making each of these places 15 minute neighborhoods? He suggests Alki, Tangletown, Wedgwood, Selwood, and some others. Um, is, that a, is that a place to start? It definitely. I, I feel like that's definitely a place to start. I mean, it's not, it's not really clear why areas in the city that could support more density that already are functioning as, in some ways, a 15 minute village. Um, 15 minute city framework, if they're not included in the growth strategy and are not receiving as much multifamily housing or signaling interest into the developer community as, as we could. So that's, I think, definitely on the table and should be. I'd also add that kind of um, qualitatively or culturally, those, are, those would be great ambassador pilot projects because the architecture that we're starting with is appealing uh, to a wide audience. It's beautifully scaled. It's not intimidating. A lot of people I've noticed um, when you say transit oriented development, they instantly think of what to them is sort of intimidating modern glassy towers with sterile frontages. And you look at some of those nodes and they're all over the city uh, and they have lots of detail. I mean, I, I don't need to spend too much time, I suppose, talking to this audience about it, but there's lots of human detail along the street and they're buildings that people like and they like the engagement of the street with storefront windows, even if right now they have you know metal blinds that are covering them up. Um, so I, I think a lot of us probably go by those nodes and, and think, man, you know, it would look better. More people would like these historic streetcar corner buildings and corner groceries if they had goods in them and, and were commercial and, and maybe even had some people living above them um, and, and some towers tucked back there. So I'm all for that from a, a messaging uh, standpoint, a way to help people see how beautiful density can be. And speaking and of messaging, sorry, yes. Speaking of messaging, I think 15 minute city or 15 minute neighborhood, which is more friendly to me, uh, is a, is certainly a much better way to talk about this than transit oriented development, which has you know, a, a collection of words that most people don't necessarily get warm and fuzzy about. You know, If they like development, they wanna be oriented towards me, not towards transit. Um, uh, we have a question that's interesting. How do we promote density without displacing amenities that are required for the 15 minute city? In the urban villages, I'm seeing retail and grocery stores and restaurants replaced with apartments. The additional housing is great, but it removes some of the walkability. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we're talking about, but I think I know it's, you know, I can think of a couple of examples. Um, in our, in our, uh, in our capitalist um, society in our current real estate world. Is that is that something we can manage? How do we manage that? So I'd like to jump into that because I've been recently thinking about that. 
And uh, I think there's a huge role for, um, for really thinking about the positive ways uh, for, for real subsidies in which there's a role in the government uh, and in, in, in local uh, governments and state governments to subsidize the differential between uh, allowing a business that perhaps was there. I can think of a um, place in Beacon Hill that um, I know is about to uh, be redeveloped where there's uh, one of the best birria and uh, Mexican food um, in 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 the neighborhood, and uh, we know that it's uh, the clock is ticking for that shop, um, and so uh, it is very unlikely that uh, uh, that restaurant is going to be able to afford the rent in the new in the new building once it opens up. But what if there was a, a program where the city provided the a complimentary support for say a period of time? five years, I don't know, three years, whatever, uh, it, there needs to be some analysis to, to identify what is reasonable, but where you could support those businesses that were a, perhaps a community jewel um, to, to remain in place after the building gets uh, developed and where also there's a role for the Office of Economic Development to provide support and identify ways in which these businesses can become more competitive to become more profitable and hopefully uh, slowly uh, cover more of that potential rent. Uh, we know we can't forever subsidize uh, businesses and it could be seen as an unfair practice eventually, uh, but at least initially there should be ways in which we can have opportunities for having in-placement strategies uh, that, that could be explored. Um, but, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to mention that uh, we've worked on ways in which there can be land use code that can support transitions, for example, requiring that even if it's residential in the beginning that the ground floor be 15 feet and can transition to a commercial use uh, where there are demand or uh, enough retail need. So those, there are things that the city could do to make the land use code a bit more supportive of transitions to commercial, even if they start with residential. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about schools for a minute. There were a couple of questions and comments about that. Um, and schools, schools have been, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Paris, one of the things that they've done is look at schools as uh, actually borrowing from America, I'm told by someone who worked for the mayor there, um, the, the idea of, of making schools and school grounds available to the community for other uses outside of school hours. Um, they've also started implementing uh, what they're calling school streets. And some of this was pandemic um, uh, influenced in that they were trying to give people a chance to, to sort of socially distance as they drop off their kids and have a place to mix and mingle, but, the, but keep the cars farther away. But all this is interesting because, um, you know, schools can really be centers of neighborhoods and they really are how many of us when we're bringing up our kids organize our lives. Is there, and, and this whole idea of multiple uses of buildings and really being super efficient um, you know, because you could maybe pack more uses into a smaller area if you can find multiple uses. But what are you, what are you seeing, hearing, and thinking about in terms of schools, school buildings, school grounds, safe routes to schools, um, the role of schools in the 15-minute city concept? I'll jump in if someone else doesn't want to. <laughs> but very briefly, um, I think from the perspective of uh, the biggest challenge and barrier for those uh, types of uh, multi-use um, experiences to happen in neighborhoods has nothing to do with planning or even design. It has to do with the kinds of agreements uh, between different agents to uh, be co-responsible for the management of a space. So for example, if a, if a school has, uh, you know, is responsible for maintaining their own grounds, right? And if there is a different use uh, for that school in, you know, after hours, and there is uh, some kind of uh, event 
uh, you know, whose liability is it? And so this is where we need to turn uh, from um, uh, the practitioners that are represented in this group, which, which are planners, architects, urbanists, et cetera, and really turn to the lawyers. And we need to invite more lawyers into these conversations to help us understand what are the appropriate mechanisms that will legally allow for these figures to start coming to life with reduced barriers of entry. And it is through having a clarity of, of uh, and accountability for the use of a space, its management um, and programming that we will be able to get there. And so the answer will lie not in a comprehensive plan, but rather in creative um, uh, mechanisms and agreements between different parties. Well, I, I think focusing on school is actually a good way uh, as part of, I think, the bottom up process I think we mentioned before. Uh, I think when you mention uh, only density, I think people kind of freak out. Uh, but if you talk about, you know, like safe route to school, uh, how to make the you know, neighborhood safer and more walkable uh, and bikeable, I mean, a lot of kids bike to school as well. Uh, so I think that changed the nature of the conversation. I really focused on you know, the issues that matter to people rather than the you know, concept that may you know, scare people away. I'd just add in just observationally, um, I live quite close to a school and um, have noticed in Seattle, and, and this all, of course, I keep circling back to the density issue. Schools are magnets for crazy driving because you have a lot of parents driving their kids to school, they're late. Anytime you have people in their routine, they're on autopilot. It makes the streets surprisingly dangerous. Ironically, um, these local neighborhood streets with uncontrolled Seattle intersections, uh, I won't let my 10 year old bike a few blocks to school because of certain uh, streets he has to cross or intersections that are full of parents, right? So there's something about needing to use, I love the Safe Routes to School program. And I think, you know, piling on to Jeff, I think it's been a really wonderful um, program to get progress and help us understand how much we all share the priority of keeping kids safe and seeing schools as they, they have to be equitably accessible to everyone, including um, kids on foot and bike. Uh, but we need to look at the design of our streets all around schools, uh, not just um, prioritize routes or crossings, um, and maybe be a little more uh, aggressive than what is warranted based on policy. Maybe take a few steps extra to control intersections and um, prohibit parking from uh, sight lines at the intersections, et cetera, where you have small bodies. Uh, some things like that that are kind of like little detail things, but could make a big difference in terms of whether parents would choose to drive or um, let their kids walk um, through their neighborhoods to their schools. Yeah, I'm aware of a program, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead, Rick. That changes asphalt playgrounds to uh, green schoolyards, uh, because I also live close to a school and it is a public space that the name, even people without kids use. Um, so programs like that, um, even investments from the city to change asphalt playgrounds to green spaces or uh, change it into open space could be super helpful. Starting with schools are, I think it's a great idea. I think I just wanted to jump in and uh, follow up on what Shannon was mentioning because it sounds like you uh, have gone through similar um, experiences in projects uh, in terms of what does it mean to really change the form and function of our streets and really what is playing up against these amazing ideas is uh, the lack of regulatory definitions that support this. And so we need a much more active and hands-on um, uh, group of practitioners informing um, the, these regulations and definitions. So things like uh, 
level of service. We know that that is a common conversation. And so the level of service of intersections and uh, what meets uh, the definition of acceptable performance, right? Uh, when acceptable performance is to design to high capacity uh, throughput of, of motor vehicles rather than uh, allowing for a little bit of additional delay in queuing at an intersection for the sake of uh, safety improvements or, or, or or people crossing the street, we're never going to get there. And so the biggest barriers, uh, you know, arterials become um, uh, insurmountable barriers for pedestrians, even when you're trying to, to when, when a government's trying to change them, if we don't change the definition of what can be deemed as acceptable and uh, change goals around vehicle miles traveled, what is acceptable in terms of countermeasures that need to be implemented for safety, et cetera. So uh, I say that a hard look at our, defin our very technical definitions that are the hidden um, uh, support, this the structural, just like there's structural racism, there's structural auto-centric uh, development. And so we need to take a look and uncover uh, those, those definitions to, to dismantle it. Yeah, and several people uh, in the chat mentioning that they, they actually are pretty close to a 15 minute city, but don't feel that way because they can't safely get the access or they feel cut off or they don't feel that it's a good idea to, uh, to try to walk to, to some of those amenities. Um, I mean, really the elephant in the room uh, is, is, this, is the automobile, right? I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the mechan mechanism whereby we were able to take the parts of the city and spread them out and connect them by the automobile. So people live in one place, shop and work, go to the school and other places and connect them all by the car. And it's also the reason why if you live in a wa almost walkable neighborhood, you don't feel like it is. Um, and in Seattle, you know, we've had for quite some time, we've had a complete streets ordinance. We've had um, grand policies about uh, aspirations toward a number of different modal plans and towards um, uh, climate improvement and climate reducing transportation emissions. And we know that transportation is the biggest source in Seattle, transportation emissions. Why the hell can't we do it? What's, what's stopping us? Are we ready now? Is it, have we reached a point or are we just gonna go electric and we're gonna be good? I, I agree with so many of the comments in the chat and what you just summarized, David, um, sort of pushing us forward a little bit. Uh, it's uh, the very visible elephant in the room. And it's fascinating to me that on paper, and I find this with a lot of things. I also find this with measuring net zero carbon projects and things like that. On paper, we seem to be doing great. And maybe by some quantitative measures, we are statistically safe because we're not trying to act like normal human beings have acted in our streets for thousands of years, but something's really wrong. And that is one of the reasons why on our projects, we try to, at least to disrupt our own thinking look at historic photos, look at how weird this time is and how recent it is in the whole timeline of humans needing space to exist and use in different ways, uh, pretty close to where they live and, and you know, ideally out the front door of their building. Um, and I, I know I keep coming back to kids, but I, I think that starting with the most vulnerable user rather than the most sophisticated user is a good design principle for any user interface and um, designer. And we're not doing that now. Like we, we may have places that work great for commuters, adult commuters and um, people who know how to navigate different kinds of um, divided user interfaces like bike lanes and bike signals mm -hmm. and um, pedestrian. Yeah, I, yeah I, and those, um... Those historical photos and, and, that, and that comment you make about what a brief moment in human history this really is, is it's, it's really helpful perspective. I mean, it's, we look wistfully back at sometimes, but they had their own issues too. But, but it really is helpful to think about um, how things do change and how we have it in our power, I think, to change things. Um, Shannon, since you brought that idea up, I'd like to give the other three, uh, and we're closing in on our, on our time, uh, you know, 30, 30 seconds or so for any last thought you might want to offer. Jeff, do you mind starting off? 
Sure, I, I think on, on this question of, you know, how can we you know, facilitate some, some major changes, I think we need stronger leadership. Uh, and we have a mayoral uh, election coming up. Uh, this is a great opportunity to really push for some you know, greater vision and, and for uh, the, the, you know, the uh, civil society organization to really come together and support a you know, candidate that can really push that grand vision. And when you run, I'll support you. Diana. I think uh, this begs the question uh, to really uh, think about and analyze. Um, I, be I become more and more uh, convinced that what uh, the Puget Sound region and, and Seattle as a city itself needs, and I can speak to my experience in Mexico City, uh, is that aggressive parking management and uh, is is needed as a foundation to make enable any of these visions because in the end the elephant in the room the car uh, is silently sleeping every day in our streets and our buildings in a parking spot and so the way to limit uh, how much we're inviting vehicles uh, motor vehicles to come to our neighborhoods and to disrupt these the 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 the, the social fabric uh, and and the urban fabric of of our of our communities is by reducing those invitations for them to come to our neighborhoods and that is by telling them you can't come and sleep and and stay uh, for the day or for part of the, the day um, the elephant sleeping on your street I love exactly that. <laughs> Um, I would just say that we need more voices in the 2024 comprehensive plan update. It's our best opportunity to change our growth strategy. Um, and I would say that's uh, as many voices as we can. About 15 minute cities would be great. So get excited about the comp plan. Maybe wonky, but it maybe <laughs> determines your future on some level. <laughs> Thanks so much. You guys are brilliant. This has been a lot of fun. And um, I hope. Uh, folks watching, listening have um, gotten what they wanted out of this. I know we, there's a lot more to dig in on, on this. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to attend and for you guys taking your time to participate. Thanks so much. Gordon, did you have any parting thoughts before we close out? Uh, no, that's great, David. Thanks everyone for coming. And the video will be available on YouTube probably sometime early next week. So if you have friends or colleagues who missed it and want to check out this amazing panel, send them the link. And thank you, David. Thanks so much for inviting me. Take care.